My perception of this is it's a study group, so we can all study kernel sources together. So I will give you an idea of where I would start and why I would start there and kind of how I would proceed. And I'm going to encourage everybody here to dispute what I say and come up with better suggestions and tell me how you think it should be done. No, I don't think we should do that. That's next week's speaker. I've scared, I've scared away. I, I don't want to be called a speaker. All right? I'm not qualified to teach the Linux kernel. I was thinking facilitator. There we go. Uh, right. Enabler. <laughs> oh, well, we won't talk about that. See, you're running as root. Uh, <laughs> terrible person. Why don't we push this out of the way? If it, if it does push, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, it rolls all over the place. Yeah. Um, so why don't we just keep rolling that back all the way around and just have lots of fun. In fact, we could probably put it right out through those door exit doors. Well, you may want to write that up. Okay, so the other thing you'll want to do is open up a browser. And what I want you to do is go to wikiversity.org. So Paul asked me to come and, and, like I said, just kind of share where I would start and what I would. Uh, Oh, oh, you you can't see the net? All right, well, let's. I'm connected to the net through my EVDO card. I've got the courtesy of my boss. Through their wireless? Google Guest. Google Guest. Oh, try Google Guest. Well, we'll see if this comes up for me. If it does, then we'll just use it. Especially since that's the last time you find all your notes. It doesn't matter. Because you see, the real trick for me is instead of trying to. Yeah, why don't you try Google Guest or we'll let, um, we'll let Larry maybe slip in here and be the. So what I decided to do when Paul asked me to do this is I thought, okay, well, you know, this sounds like a topic that would be suitable for Wikiversity. How many people here have ever heard of Wikiversity? All right, you've all heard of Wikipedia, right? Well, Wikipedia, the, the media wiki, or excuse me, the, the Wikimedia Foundation drives a number of other sites that are not, strictly speaking, an encyclopedia. One of which is a place for people to collaborate on creating courseware that would be suitable for, like, college or university courses. And that's Wikiversity. I thought, okay, well, this sounds like a Wikiversity thing, and I have a login on Wikiversity. What the heck, I'll create a page on Wikiversity reading the Linux kernel sources. Yeah. And that's where I decided to put this stuff. So as soon as he gets up here and running. <laughs> now, the question of if you're going to read the kernel sources, presumably you're going to try and do one of two things. You either want to learn more about programming, learn how the kernel works. Perhaps you're already a, an applications programmer. You want a better understanding of systems level programming. or Maybe you're a little bit more focused and you actually just want to go in there and start changing things right away. You, you have a, a device that needs a device driver. You want to write one. All right. This is particularly handy if, for instance, like this gentleman here, I believe, works at um, Sun, you said? No. Somebody over here said they worked at Sun, worked with the Sun sources, kernel sources a bit. Anyway, if you've already done kernel level programming for some other operating system, then you might be reading the kernel sources to figure out how it's organized, to figure out where you can start doing your thing. But the first question that comes to my mind is, where do you start? Well, let me throw it out to people. You've got 1.7 million lines of code scattered in tens of thousands of files, hundreds of directories. Where are you going to start reading this mess? Yeah. Boot. 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 OK, what's where? The what's the path? Well, what's the first stuff that gets run when you turn your computer on? Well, OK, so you, you might ask yourself, where does the CPU start on your kernel? All right? So your kernel gets loaded by some kind of loader. Lilo, Grub, whatever. 
And once that thing has it, the kernel in memory, then it jumps into something inside the kernel, and it the, the kernel has to make some assumptions about where it got loaded and what kind of memory is available and where it can start on all this stuff. Now, the kernel doesn't just run on PCs. So actually, when you ask the question, where do you start, where does the kernel start, then the obvious answer is, well, that depends on what kind of platform you're on, what kind of bootloader put you into memory. We're going to, of course, focus on PCs. Why? Because that's what we're all using, frankly. All right, I see X. I'd love to see a browser. <laughs> it will make them happier. <laughs> Able to do what? OK. So one place is where the kernel starts. Now, on a PC, I'm sure most of you are aware 32-bit PCs start in an old, archaic mode of the CPU called real mode. Anybody know what real mode means and why they call it real mode? As opposed to protected mode? It's the old 8086 mode, and the reason it's called real mode is because at that point in time, there's no virtual memory. So every address corresponds to a real location in physical RAM. Now, there's some funky stuff about how it actually does the addressing, the segment offset stuff, so that there isn't actually technically a single address that resolves to, you know, each physical location in memory can have many different possible segment offset addresses, one of which is canonical, that is, the lowest segment that could reach it. But anyway, the processor starts out in this funky mode, and that mode is useless for running something like a Linux kernel or any kind of Unix kernel. So the first thing that has to happen is the CPU has to be shifted somehow into protected mode. But it gets slightly more complicated because before you can even do that, uh, go ahead and search on Linux uh, kernel source. Do we need to go into English? And now it goes there for us automatically. So down here. Hit the Linux one. There we are. Reading the Linux kernel sources. I just added that yesterday. I guess our AV guys are uh, trying to figure out how to capture this on their video or something along those lines. Control all backspace will kill his X session. Control all plus or minus will loop through the available resolution. It doesn't Yeah, basically in the file, talking about X configuration here, sorry for the digression, but um, in the file it says the, the resolutions that this X server supports, and it just has a list, space separated list, and it cycles in whatever, you know, starts at whatever your default is, the first one on that list, or there's a, somewhere else there's an option to say, set a default resolution. And then it goes from that one, and it cycles around, and then loops back to the beginning and cycles around. Anyway. Well, we've lost him. So, um, how many people know why the Linux kernel is named VM Linux with a Z? Compressed. Because it's a compressed file system image. And why is that? Like, PCs are pretty much the only place where they do that. It's actually worse than that. It's not because of the disk space. 
I mean, it's nicer that it takes up a little less space, but frankly, the real reason is because the kernel rapidly grew to the point where you could not load it entirely in real mode in the 640K limit. Okay, in real mode, you can address one meg of address space, but address space isn't the same as memory. And the uh, architects of the IBM PC in its early days, they reserved the top 384K of address space for I.O. devices and for memory mapping, for future expansion, and for ROMs. So you have 640K of address space, or excuse me, of memory that can be addressed in real mode. Now, that was the original reason why the early kernels were compressed. And then later, how many people here remember Z image versus BZ image when you were building your kernels? So the BZ image was the better Z image. Actually, as far as I know, is actually not related to BZ, you know, like BZIP and GZIP. It's actually the, the B there is for something else. Because like BZIP is buffered, it uses a larger buffer for doing the compression, whereas GZIP uses a smaller sliding window buffer for it or something like that. It's some weird stuff. But the point is that with BZ image, they came up with a way of shifting the processor such that they could address extended memory and load things into it. Kind of like DOS used to be able to make extended memory uh, RAM disks. Even though it was still in real mode, it had this way of addressing it and it kept sw slipping in and out of protected mode or doing something funky in order to map that around. So BZ image basically uses a piece of code that knows how to do some of that. So the kernel is compressed so that it can be loaded into memory, possibly extended memory. And then there is actually an entry point, head.s. Capital S in the kernel sources is assembly language. And so the bootloader actually jumps into a file named head.s. Now at one point earlier, it was possible, it used to be possible to take a Linux kernel and DD it onto a floppy and use it just raw. You could put that floppy in and boot off of it and it would load a Linux kernel without any kind of lilo or grub or anything. The disadvantage of this mode, of this way of doing it, there are two disadvantages. One of them is you couldn't pass any kernel command line arguments. You had no control over how it ran, which means that you could only use whatever root file system was compiled into that kernel rather than being able to choose root equals blah, 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 blah. That's one disadvantage. The other disadvantage is that that mode has no longer been supported since about 2003. They ripped it out. If you go to the 2.6.22 kernel today and you look at bootsect.s, then there will be a line in there, a comment, that says something like, uh, gutted by HP Anvin 2003. And if you look down a little further, it, there's a little error message. So it's assembly language, and there's a, a text string that it prepares and it, it shoves out to the video for you that says, this mode is no longer supported. It refrains from saying, you idiot. But it does say something about you have to use a bootloader. OK? So we're using a bootloader. You're, it's a compressed image. And head.s is this little thing. And if you start reading it, it says, well, OK, first, I know that I'm going to be loaded at this point in, a, in memory. And then I'm going to move myself out of the way for this other reason. It has some stuff about ACPI tables and what it's going to do to like not trash those. And then there's a little section of, of assembly that moves the kernel to a different place, and another little chunk that decompresses it. And then at the end of that, it clears the BX register and jumps, does a jump to whatever the uh, uh, extended BP register is pointing at. So now I look at this and I go, well, gee, OK, my assembly is like a little weak anyway, because it's been a long time since I did anything with assembly, and all I ever did was like Hello World and like little student projects and stupid little hacks. Um, but gee, where does it go from here? What's the next file I want to read? I read head.s, and at the end of it, it's jumping into some place that is not clear from the, con you know, from the comments. The other question I have is, is it even possible today to load an uncompressed Linux kernel? And if so, where does it jump to? Now, I think I know, but the point is that for those of us just trying to jump in and start reading the kernel, 
maybe this isn't the best place to start reading. <laughs> maybe it's a little confusing. So where else might you think to start reading the kernel sources? What's a good functional point? Scheduler? So what has to happen before the scheduler is important? I mean, what does the scheduler schedule? Processes. Process loading. Processes. And actually, the Linux kernel is a little um, interesting, I think unique among um, Unix kernels in that the scheduler not only schedules uh, user space processes, but actually a lot of kernel threads are created specifically so that they can be schedulable tasks. Right? So when you do a PS listing of uh, you know, under Linux, you notice all those things with square brackets, mm -hmm. those funny looking things with the low PIDs, and some of them will even have high number PIDs. So a Linux kernel uh, reserves all of the PIDs less than, I think it's 100, for kernel threads. And in addition, some of these kernel threads are going to be have higher number PIDs. The reason why there are square brackets around those, where is information about processes stored? How does the PS command find them? In proc. Under slash proc. And what do you find under slash proc? You find a series of directories, one for every process. And one of the files you're going to find in there, there's a couple of them, but one of them is a map file that tells you about the address space mappings. And there's another one I have to actually look at it to remember. If you cat those various files, one of them actually contains the process, the, the process argument string. So that's arg 0 and all of its arguments. But if that file is not present, then there's another file under slash proc that has a different string. If it can't get it where it's from where it's supposed to, it puts square brackets around it and gets it from that other location. I'm sorry, I don't remember it exactly. I have to go dig under proc and find it myself. But the point is that all kernel threads, the one thing that distinguishes a kernel thread from a normal user space process, if you're under proc and you're looking at each of these entries, there's a, a, a surefire sign that something was never a user space process. It has no maps. Because the maps entry under slash proc and your PID says what the user space memory mappings were for that process. And a kernel thread has no user space memory mappings. All right, so you've got all these threads, and the scheduler is going to schedule time, for, time slices for the threads. And then it's going to do it for user space processes. Um, and you know that it's also on most, well, on many systems today, they're either hyper-threaded or dual core. So you know that somewhere in the initialization, it had to have spawned off right, multiple you know, kernels, each on running on their own CPU. So there's a lot of weird scheduling stuff that's involved in SMP. Where is user space coming from? Classic Unix kernel starts exactly one user space process ever. In it. An it. Exactly. So I personally, when I first decided I wanted to read through the kernel sources, I searched around to find out where init was being started. And I asked myself a bunch of questions, because before I try and read the sources, I'm going to say, well, what do I think should be there so I can look for it? Because if I see the things that I'm pretty sure should be there, then I know I'm looking in the right place. And if I see a bunch of other stuff, then I'm learning something about, oh, I didn't expect to see this, or no, I didn't think about that. So my advice when you're trying to read the, the Linux kernel sources is, let's start at someplace like init. In other words, pick something in user space that you understand, that you know about, and try and find where that is in the kernel sources to dig through with grep and you know vi or your favorite browser. Now of course, when we bring up this um, browser again, you know, I'm perfectly happy with you if you wanted to go back to the old video mode and you just resize the windows so that they're showing up on here. That's what I'm I don't, trying to do. It just oh, right. it broke down. All right. It, 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 it rebooted and it it launched. All right, right. wonderful. Well, that's okay. So, um, <laughs> Everybody here is familiar with L, uh, lxr.linux.no, right, the Linux cross-reference? So you can start clicking through there, and that's really nice because, of course, everything is cross-linked and searchable. 
but I still recommend that you also, because the grep capabilities, grep-like capabilities at LXR are not as good as what you can do with a command line and the find command. So there's still some stuff you can't find. Like for example, another possible way to find out where you are, to kind of orient yourself in the kernel, is you take one of the kernel messages. Now, how do those kernel messages get to your screen? There's a print K. If you look at a very early version of the kernel, like 1.09, and by the way, this is going to be another tip that I'm going to give you. When you're looking at the kernel sources, go back and look at the earliest version that supported something. Once you find it or you think you found it in something recent or while you're looking at it, go grab the oldest kernel you can find and go try and find it in there if it was something that was going to be supported that far back. Now, obviously, 1.0.9 didn't support SMP at all. It didn't support any kind of ACPI, any kind of APM. It didn't have... Uh, automatic module loading like kernel D or kmod, none of that stuff. All right? But at least when you can go back to 2.2 or 2.4, you can see where the kernel was simpler. There's just fewer lines of code to hunt through, and you can read it, and then you can compare what happens. So if you look at main, so if you look at uh, init slash main dot c from the 1.09 kernel, you see that they used printf. Now, they can't really use the real printf. You know that. Why can't they use the real printf from libc? Because ultimately, libc depends on system calls. And the kernel is the thing that provides the system calls. So it's your classic chicken and egg. I really need to fix you. Has to be like needs a, a, um, a, a notebook. Login as root, <laughs> dpackage dash reconfigure got, got, X, got, got, or he can do it. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> we really didn't want to turn this into a sysadmin class. I mean, I'm much stronger at sysadmin. I could teach weeks worth of that, but it's kind of not what you were expecting. <laughs> All right. Um, so. What are the things that have to happen? If, if you were going to go and look at, first of all, I'll, I'll tell you where uh, the init process is started. It's in a subdirectory near the top. So just off of top, there's a subdirectory named init. And the file that loads it is main.c. So init slash main.c is the first file that I would suggest a normal person, especially a normal C programmer, look at when trying to read the kernel sources. Now, based on that little tidbit, what are some things you're going to expect to see before the kernel can start a knit? Set up the address space. Pardon? Set up the address space. So it's going to have to do some memory initialization, but let's go a little higher level. I want to go, what's the, what's the last thing it probably has to do before it can start a knit? The very last thing. What do you expect to be maybe the line before exec ve init, or whatever the kernel's internal name for its exec ve function? No, output logging is done. OK, so print k is the kernel printf. And it prints into a circular ring buffer. So in other words, basically, it says, take var args, dump it from here to, you know, from the current end of the, the circular buffer. Um, dump the string in there, move the pointer up to the new end of that string, and then you're done. Mm -hmm. And then the next print k is going to do that again. So there's going to be some locking code around that. But that's all it does. It's just constantly looping through this static size buffer and overwriting the oldest message with the newest. And so all it has is these two little pointers that it's chasing its tail all around. Simple ring buffer. Right. Everybody here has done a ring buffer written in C or something like it? Understand what we're talking about there? Say that again, a ring buffer? A ring buffer. In other words, it's a static block of memory, mm -hmm. and you've got a couple of pointers, and you're just chasing the end of it oh, okay. and saying, the, the head of this thing is currently here. And you keep writing to it, and every time you hit here, then you're just chasing it around. Okay. All right. The, the reason you have two pointers is because you have to remember where the end of the valid string is and where the next the first available string is. 
because they won't always line up. It's kind of weird. All right. So I, I had just asked, what's the last thing you expect to happen before you start you exec init? So we already got that all set up somewhere deeper. What's the very last thing you have to do? You have to set up the stack for argc, argv, and on put init. Okay, you have to set up the environment, which is the command tail and any environment. And actually, there you can find what the path is to the init process because it does have a path before you know, before any user space is run. Yeah. Dump everything that precedes it from memory so that you're not wasting space. There is a part of the kernel. He, he brings up an interesting thing. It's not the last thing you do, but he, he does bring up a point. There's a bunch of boot data that's in the kernel that has a lot of code in it for doing auto detection, a lot of strings that it uses that's only used during the initial auto detection of the hardware and configuration. And then that is marked as a special segment by the compiler so that at the end of it, you can see that it says freeing a certain amount of memory. Now remember earlier I had said, when you're looking at the, the D message output or the print case as the thing is booting up, you can look at something like boot data command line is, you know, boot data okay, command line is. That's the very first line I see when I'm booting a, uh, one of my kernels. Just so happens. The very first line in my D message on this laptop. And one of the very last lines you see is freeing some amount of memory. Right? So if you search for the print K with that string in it, then you're diving into the source and now you know where you are. You've oriented yourself. You say, OK, I know when that happens. Now, one of the things that you, if you think about it, the kernel takes a command line, including an init equals. So logically, at least some of that command line parsing had to have happened before you ran init. Because if that was set, then it's going to try and ex execute that instead of init. And if that fails, it's going to give an error message. So that might be something I would see just before it actually execs init, is an attempt to exec something else. Now, I might see a bunch of kernel command line parsing before that. It turns out I won't. That's hidden in some other file somewhere, right? it turns out. Somewhere in the includes and the, in the functions that lead up to it. It's further back. Right? Uh, another thing is, uh, as he pointed out, you need an environment. What else are you need for this process? You should be able to read the thing from this. You need a mounted file system. So somewhere I already have to have found and mounted root, probably read only, and being able to find it. Also, we know that if you put a copy of init, the init binary, in Etsy, it'll actually get executed before slash has been init. You could do an experiment and find that out, but it turns out that that's where it searches first. That's an old and ancient Sun OS thing. You used to actually have your, your init binary in slash Etsy. And you look in main, you want to go to. Um, well, that's just a great backdoor way to happen. Hmm? Well, you know, if, if your Etsy, hey, if your Etsy directory is writable by hostile people, you're already dead. <laughs> You're dead before you started because I can modify a knit tab. Well, if I can modify a knit tab and you're running a knit, I already own you. And also, there's a magic file named a knit script. If I can write to your Etsy directory, I can do that. I can make it do anything instead of what your knit tab said. So I already own you. So, and plus, I can modify your password and shadow files. So I already own you. If your Etsy is. Yeah. Huh? Um, Actually, what I'd like you to do is go back to your browser, go to the Wikiversity thing, and find that page that he was using. You might want to resize that. Oh, OK, you got it. And you might want to move that down and to the left just a little bit so everybody can see it. OK, there you go. Oh, oh it's the browser edges. Yeah, sorry. There you go. I kind of vaguely remember what it says, so I don't need it nearly as much as everybody else here does. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're reading it in Italian. Or somebody was. Okay, there. Let's go to this uh, second link right here. 
This is what I just tossed together in a day and a half. And actually, not even that much time. Um, well, I'm kind of hoping that as things progress, everybody else who's participating in this, you know, the facilitators, but also all of you, will go in and edit this and add your own stuff. So I talked a little bit about this. Actually, why don't we go ahead and click on that one, the bootsec.s. Well, I just want to show you that part, just so you believe me when I say, um, go back up to the top to the comments. Um, gutted by H. Peter Anvin, 2003. Do I have a good memory or what? <laughs> All right, keep going down a little bit. So it talks about how we're in real mode. A little further. There we go. Bugger off message. <laughs> so this was probably not the best place to start reading the Linux, excuse me, the PC version of the Linux kernel sources. Now, if you're on a Spark, there's probably a bootsect.s for Sparks that is perhaps more useful. I don't know. I didn't look there. So let's go ahead and go back. Yeah, well, the one for Sparks would have to handle all those different kinds of Sparks. So uh, it might be a little excited too. Let's go down a little further. It also has OpenProm to help it out. So you notice I even asked myself some questions. Because here we talk about, um, all right, go to head.s. Now, as far as I can tell, and I could be wrong here, because I don't know everything. But as far as I can tell, just jump down a little bit further. Right there, stay. So C line 34, as far as I can tell, that is the very first instruction being executed by your Linux kernel when it's compressed. That the bootloader is jumping to that label right there. Does it not start in 16 bit mode? No. Something else has already shifted it into protected mode. I Well, no, actually, if you read the comments at the top, even though it says start up 32, this is actually starting up. It's contained. It's, it's just the name of the label. So right. It's maybe. No, no, I think that start up 32 is the actual start of the 32 bit oh. code. There is right. some, there is some code that it would be. Line move. 8. Yeah. If you move from a right. front loader that, that starts in 16 bit mode, it starts in one place. And if you move from one that starts in 32 bit mode, that's where it starts. Uh, right. In the 16 bit mode, all that it does is switch into the 32 bit mode and go here. So. And switching into 32 bit mode from 16 mode, 16 bit mode is some ugly, hairy, complicated stuff. I have found that piece of code. And because you have to set up these descriptor tables, uh, at least a global descriptor table, an interrupt descriptor table, and I think you need at least one local descriptor table, but I don't remember. So you have to set up a couple of descriptor tables and then pass pointers to them in the call that shifts it into 32-bit um, mode so that whatever those are pointing at become what's called the control program. In other words, the thing that all of the exceptions that are raised and the, the thing that can actually modify the descriptor tables after that. In other words, the thing that is the kernel. Right? It's the thing that has control over everything else running on the system. And anything that tries to access memory outside of its memory bounds, you know, that violates the, the paging, right? that's exception 13 in the, um, in the x86 world. What are we doing now? I was going to pull up the how to on, uh, on the boot sector. I mean, on, on how it actually does that stuff. There used to be one, and that's really hard to find. Add it to the wiki when you find it. There's an extra yes. <laughs> so one of the sources that I reference in my page is the old Kernel Hacker's Guide, which was by Alessandro Rubini from like 1996 or something. It talks about the 1.09 kernel. But you can actually read that, and it tells you a lot of stuff that's still valid. Oh, I remember this one. Yeah, you should definitely cut and paste this. Because I have seen this before, too. It's just been a long time. OK, well, go ahead and go back over to the other one. And back. All right, so I babble a little bit about that. Let's go down, page down here. And here's where I come to the conclusion that probably this is where we want to start. Now, one of the things that 
we have to do before we can start a process is we have to connect standard out, standard in, standard error to file descriptors. And you'll actually see where the kernel calls dupe. But before you can do that, what are those connected to? How many people here have ever managed to somehow manage to blow away your TTY zero device? Or attempted to boot up a system where the dev directory got renamed or blown away or something? What's the, what's the warning message you see just before it attempts to exec init? Anybody remember? Heather, you can go for it. You're asking me to remember, though. <laughs> Warning, unable to open initial console. So the kernel is actually going to open your console and then dupe that file descriptor a couple of times and pass that into its own exec. All right, let's go down a little bit further here. Yeah, keep going. There's, there we go. So this is where I said we should start, right here. Right, which means we got almost 800 lines of other page, uh, lines, 800 lines that we can read above this. So you notice, just like, I, oh, it starts, I'm sorry, I was mistaken. It starts at slash sbin init, but then it tries to see if there's one in Etsy, one in bin. Then it tries to start a shell, if nothing else. But go up a little further. If execute command, so if your command line argument, your kernel command line contained and it equals, then it set that and it's trying to then pass it to this and it gives you a warning. So if we go up a little further, now we see this run init process. Go, go down a little bit further. See? It's calling this function a bunch of times. Now, if you go back to the old 1.09 version of the kernel and you read this same file, so open up a new tab. I would have just right clicked on one of those things to get us to the right place, but that's okay. Browse the code. Uh, yep, 1.09, init. Yeah, no, it's init, not kernel init. init main.c. That was actually the only file in that directory back then. <laughs> uh, and the total length of this, go ahead and page down, it's like 50 lines long. Or, no, no, I guess 500 lines. Okay. But if you go back, we want to start near the end. Here, wait. There you go. Stop. Yeah. yeah. That's where it was doing. And it was doing exec VE is what it called it then. And notice that back then they used, they had their own version of sprintf and printf that they were using that was intended to emulate. Yes, Heather? What? Oh, somebody brought me a mocha with honey. It looks like. I mean, a latte, excuse me. With honey. I worked hard on it. She worked hard too. <laughs> ah, this one was brought to you by caffeine. <laughs> so anyway, you, you can see how they've changed things. Because <laughs> let's switch back to the other one. So what? why don't we go find this? And as I recall, it's, it's defined in this file here. But if you click on it, defined in, okay, so it was defined only a few dozen lines further up. Static void and it process. It doesn't an exec Well, except that it's, right. they preceded exec the with kernel underscore. Now in some of the versions of the kernel, you see the for every system call that you're used to in Unix and Linux, the kernel's internal name for it was do underscore whatever that was. And then in this one, they've migrated towards a convention of kernel underscore, whatever the system call is. And they changed print after print K because they're trying to be less confusing, right? Because then people would go, well, in printf, I can blah, 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 percent sign F, <laughs> format specifiers, blah, why isn't that working? They didn't want people to 
to overload their brains the wrong direction. If it's not going to behave just like printf, don't name it printf. Give it another name. Right? And this is what I was saying earlier about how it's really handy if you're going to read the kernel sources, keep flipping back and looking at the oldest version of the kernel that supported whatever this is. So on that note, if you were going to read the kernel sources, where would you go from here? Uh, something really tiny. Something really tiny. Like what? Uh, I'm not sure the console driver is tiny, but it's probably the next uh, Something serial. Well, OK, so if we go in, I like the way he split these. So let's go over to this. This is the newer one. The one on the left is the newer one. Yeah, this is the newer one. So let's go back down to where it does that first, OK, sys underscore open, dev console. Okay. Can we resize? Well, see, that's the disadvantage of having done this, because I wanted to see the whole one. OK. Um, <laughs> so yeah. here's where we actually sit. Yeah, actually splitting it the other way probably would be better, but that's fine. So. Unable to open an initial console. Now we see that it isn't actually hard coded in there. And why isn't it hard coded? I'm sure you know that. If you think about it for a second. What is not hard coded? The, the device that it's going to try and use as the dev console. It could be serial line or a VGA Because it's a kernel argument. Because it's another one of them kernel arguments. And it's also, uh, remember, how many people here remember the old? root flags command, also known as video mode, things oh. like that. Right. This is a thing. So inside the kernel, your default root device, if you try and boot a kernel with no command line arguments at all, no root equals, it's going to try and mount up a particular device as the root file system. Actually, it depends on how you compiled it. Whatever the default is that the make files would take whatever the root device was on the machine while you're building it and poke the major number and the minor number into the kernel image. And root flags would modify those two numbers. The point is it's not being stored inside the kernel as a string. The default boot device is stored as a major and minor number. There were several different things, not almost anything. There was just like a dozen or so different things, like the, the starting video mode and the, the RAM disk size and whether or not to prompt for a RAM disk. And you know, these were all just little static bytes in a compressed kernel that you could modify to, to, to deal with a kernel before the kernel developers bit the bullet and said, you know what, we're not going to allow raw booting at all anymore. You must have a bootloader, right? Which they only did in 2003. Which sadly seems very recent to me. <laughs> Would you rather split it horizontally? Yeah, I think I'd rather split it horizontally. And put the newer one on the bottom, because that's the one I'm likely to point at one. So how are we doing on time, anyway? Hmm? Wow. And there's a clock in the lower right corner. Well, I'm, I'm willing to keep going. If just, let, me, let me put it out to you. Does anybody want to take a short break right now? You know, like one of those bio breaks. <laughs> you know, I guess Jim does. Empty certain reservoirs, refill other ones. I'm fine. I can keep going. Oh, and, and Paul actually wanted to thank John. Jonathan for helping clean this. When we got here, there was all the there was stuff scattered all over the tables, and a few people just ran over here and shook things up and cleaned it up for us all. Okay, well everybody, thank John. Oh, there he is. There he is. All right, round of applause for John. Thank you. And maybe what five minutes? This is John the security. And yeah, let's go ahead and take five minutes so everybody who needs to hit a restroom or go get coffee or do yeah. both, whichever. And anybody who has questions or things you want me to bring up before we're done tonight, come on up if you're feeling bashful and don't want to yell them out the whole room. Oh, it's more about the laptop.
That's okay. Okay. Linux can't run without an MMU. In the sense that there is actually an MMU-less version of Linux. And in fact, there was once upon a time a version of Linux called the Embeddable, um, Embeddable Linux Kernel Subset, ELKS, E-L-K-S, which could actually run in real mode on an x86. Now, as far as I know, the version of no MMU Linux that's integrated into the sources today cannot run on an x86 because there just isn't enough address space. It's designed for something like a 68K processor and the various derivatives of it, like Dragon Ball and things like that, that are designed really for running like PDAs and things like that. The advantage of something like a 68K is it has a larger address space than the old, um, like I think the um, earliest 68Ks had like a 24-bit address space or something like that. So it could go up to 12 meg. They had 32-bit registers pretty early. Um, and uh, the MMU-less Linux can run on those because there is actually enough memory to do useful things. But at the same time, I would not consider that to be truly a Unix. It's a good kernel for doing embedded systems work, for running your own processes, but you have no memory protection. And what really makes something Unix is that it is a multi-user operating system with memory protection among the multiple processes and mountable file systems. If you look back at the history of operating systems, those are the features that really make it Unix as opposed to something else. I don't want to get too, too far or something, but you see Linux processes actually have protection on each other. They just don't have... They don't have, don't have memory protection. protection. No, they don't have memory don't protection. Have memory protection. Okay. If there's no MMU, there's no way to do memory protection. Okay, so they could actually, if they were well behaved, they could be referenced into each other. Exactly. But as they, but they actually do run side by side. You can get multi. I didn't say that there was no multitasking on MMU list Linux. I only said there was no memory protection that I know of. Yes, SHN, run top. Sure, you can do all of that, and as long as all the applications have been compiled to behave themselves then you're fine. But any one of them, just, yeah, and this you know, first bug can overwrite your kernel. Because the kernel doesn't get protection either in that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I can't hear you. Sorry. I can't hear the question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't repeat the question. So um, what Paul had said is that um, on MMU-less Linux, you can't actually run multiple processes. And I said, yeah, well, of course, that's true. I was clarifying that there's still no memory protection. So any process could overwrite anybody else's memory, and in fact, could even overwrite kernel space on an MMU-less Linux. Now, if you wanted to do a Google search on the old ELKS project, I personally have not heard word zero of ELKS in like at least five years. It's been longer. <laughs> it's probably been longer. Right. Uh, you might want to quote. There was a commit in 2006, only a year ago? There's apparently enough commits to generate the news item. That's a Oh my god. I'm scared. Two commits in 2003. The funny thing is. That's when you run Linux on your wrist block. What about UC Linux? That's just a variant. UC Linux is MMU Linux. The old UC Linux or microcontroller Linux. Um, what they eventually did, that was a, um, like ELKS, it started as an offshoot of the original Linux project, Linux kernel. And remember, ELKS was embeddable Linux kernel subset, because you just couldn't fit all of the normal Linux kernel functionality into the, um, the x86 address space in real mode. But um, things like UC Linux, like I said, those usually run on microcontrollers that have more address space. Hello? I don't remember. This seems some of top boxes and such, you know. Well, yeah. Really you see when I close the top boxes today are a uh, for a for like a original phone. Yeah, which is a 68k it's processor. Like Dragon Ball 68k. So it still has enough address space to do more and you've got a couple of meg in the oldest palms you still had a couple of meg of RAM if I recall correctly. Like so, by the palm 3. Um, well, so anyway, 
Um, the MMU-less features of UC Linux were eventually merged into the mainstream. So if you look in these kernel sources, if we were to drill down in there, you can actually see, a, uh, I think it's under architecture. He wanted to jump up to the top. Which, of course, brings us to another thing you can do. All right, you jump around a whole bunch. It's all right. No, 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 not under architectures, but rather under the Arch directories. So just go ahead and click on the. Yeah, go to the parent. Oh, I see you're trying to do it. You're trying to get a directory. Yeah, see, you can go to subdirectories there. Anybody dizzy yet? <laughs> so where are we? Uh, we're looking under Arch, and we're going to uh, try yeah, and find. We, we saw this last time. I yeah, the, uh, M68K, no MMU. Yeah, that's it. That's so it's actually a sub-architecture of 68K, I think. Well, actually, it's a completely separate architecture. It's a mm. directory. So if it were. Did anybody else? It's not compatible. Right. So how many people here follow LWN? particularly the LWN Linux pages. All right. This will be probably my third tip. I wasn't really keeping track, but my third tip for you is religiously read LWN every week. And particularly if you want to understand kernel stuff, read the LWN kernel page every week. And yeah, while you're at it, give, the, give these guys some money. <laughs> Now, I'm not affiliated with them. I don't make a dime off of telling you you should give them some money. What is the LWN? Oh, Linux Weekly News, but it's LWN.net. Uh, would you open up a page on LWN? This is the single most important news site for Linux that I have ever found. The most important things. Grumpy Editor's Guide. I like that. <laughs> oh, he has a whole series of Grumpy Editor's Guide. We actually have a corporate yeah. All right. Well, there's security, but we're kind of focusing on kernel today. So one of the, the topics that's come up recently, just like a few weeks ago, was the, the merge of the 386 architecture with x86-64. Since a lot of the functionality is similar between them, you got one CPU that has an um, what's the, the a long mode addressing space, right? And 64-bit registers. So, and more of them. And a few more of them. So, um, the decision was uh, argued out on the Linux kernel mailing list pretty extensively to actually combine those two architectures rather than continue to maintain them separately. So that'll be kind of interesting in the future as you're trying to read um, the. So some of that cleanup work started in 2623. You know, it's useful. I sometimes come across it. What I really used to love was Zach Brown's um, uh, kernel traffic. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, he stopped doing it a couple of years ago. He just ran out of time to do it. But that used to be great because um, what he used to do is give you a summary of what all the traffic had been about on the mailing list over the last week, broken down by topics and uh, adding his own little insights and thoughts into it. So, so you still get an executive level summary in the front of, is it LJ, Linux Journal, the Dead Tree Edition? He still writes a column once a month. That's right. It is compressed. And I think you can see the older versions online the, from the previous month. Yes. There's also a really good kernel reference on LWN that's actually freely available. All of these um, API changes and all kinds of crap. Is here. So I think even the yep. whole the book was it. Um, so the other thing I think I'd like to cover today, now before we go any further, does anybody have any questions or any other comments you want to make or suggestions you want to throw out? Don't be shy. Today or for overall? Well, we only have about a half hour left, I think. All right, can you pull up? Uh, 
the most recent um, kernel patch message says the latest patch is such and such. There we go. Just um, click on. You used to be able to actually see the patch itself. Go ahead and go to the release button where it says released. What I actually want to see is the patch itself in text. All right. I don't care, any one of them. That's all right, we're not going to read the whole thing. What we're going to do, though, can you move it over a little bit so we can see it? You need to look up the this from last RC. So. All right. That's not what you want. <coughs> no, what I actually want is I want to see a kernel patch, yeah. just the raw <laughs> dip. That's a plain text file. Hey, what's the new patch? This is nice. Uh, this is yeah. there. Uh, OK, so you want just the text. Yeah. So another way to get your feet wet in learning a lot more about the kernel, it's kind of haphazard, kind of ad hoc, and it's totally luck of the draw. One of the things you can do is when you download a new patch, how many people here ever patch your kernel sources and rebuild your own kernels? I kind of hope if you're coming to a, a meeting like this, that you've been doing that on a fairly regular basis, you're accustomed to it. So one of the amazing things you can do is you can actually just try and read the patch and go, how much can I figure out about what this patch is doing just reading through the source code and the comments on what changed? And then naturally, when you've seen something and it uh, sparks your interest, you're going, okay, well, let's see. They're replacing this line with that line, but I don't understand enough of what it's doing. Then you go back up to the dash, dash, dash line and open up the original and actually read the C file. Actually, one time I did that, I discovered that they had the same kind of thing that they were adjusting, so they basically fixed both of them. both in there, but they were both the same thing. They only needed one or the other when they were done. <laughs> The point is that, I don't know about you, but uh, it's easy to get lost in the kernel sources for me, All right? So I start looking at it, my eyes glaze over probably just every bit as fast as any of yours, maybe a little faster. I got a little attention deficit thing going on. So something like this, where I just kind of browse through it and go, oh, that's interesting. I think I can almost understand that. Maybe I should go look at it a little further. And again, if you take this, you take a line that's in here and you go to LXR, now you start following those links and you say, well, who refers to this function? How is it being called? And from where is it being called? All right. Now, I'll give you a warning. If you, um, going back to the uh, uh, LXR. <laughs> Huh? Have we looked at GitWeb yet? I've never looked at it. I wouldn't even know where to start with GitWeb. Uh, the kernel tree. Uh, yeah, I know. I know what it is. I've just never looked at it. <laughs> I am so like last millennium with this stuff. Give me a plain old diff and use the patch command. I'm <laughs> and yes, I should learn how to use Git. Me a call thing. We don't need to learn how to use Git in order to look at GitLab. Well, all right. I haven't looked at it yet. Um, but perhaps uh, in a moment, we can have him pull it up, and we can look at it all together and figure it out. Right. So what I wanted to do was. This is 1.09 up here, so we're going to have to We need the whole kernel source still. You can you just pick either one of those windows. What I wanted to do. Uh, I'm so confused. 
was the whole thing. So search on um, on boot. Uh, it doesn't show that. Oh, boot set. Well, yeah, no, you want free text search. What are you looking for? I'm looking for an example. Well, what I wanted to show was basically one of the things. Go ahead and go into. Sure. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't actually have an example on that original wiki page to show you this, but it's something I came across here. Go on down a little bit. Um, I'm looking for a function that's going to have, um, that has a kind of a generic sounding name. <coughs> Go back up to the init. Yeah, hit on this init call here. Click on that. So one of the things that you're going to find is sometimes when you're following these hyperlinks around, if you see that it's defined here in multiple different places, sometimes because of the size of the kernel tree, there is a function that's an internal kernel function that's defined in one place. There's another function completely unrelated to it that's Maybe. defined somewhere else. And because of the way the compiler is going through the tree, the two names don't actually conflict with one another. They're being linked into different bits of code. But general, to something some like the, right? some of them, and then there are some where it's just they're completely different. They aren't. They just happen to be name collisions that have nothing to do with one another. They don't collide? Some of the reasons they don't collide have to do with which object files they're being linked into. And some of them are basically only within scope within a particular .o file, so that by the time they link that .o file to something else, since the symbol isn't being exported, it doesn't matter that it has a name collision with this one over here, because they're in different scopes. So when you're trying to follow this, sometimes you're going to follow something, you're going to go, what, what the heck? Yeah. All right. I'll give you an example. Probably the worst piece of kernel hacking I personally have had to do was a few months ago, I had a Red Hat kernel. It was like a, there was a driver, a SATA driver and an NVIDIA Ethernet driver that worked just fine in 2.4.21-42 or something. But it, we needed it to work. We need to be able to load a module on an unmodified 2.4.21-37 kernel. So these particular drivers, I was trying to backport them. Now this is 2.4.21-something or another. They're two different Red Hat kernels. You wouldn't expect this to be very difficult. But it turns out that you know how one module can depend upon another module? Mm -hmm. So in the intervening patch sets that Red Hat had applied, they had moved things around so that um, one of the um, Ethernet uh, ETH tool and MMI tool, those had changed and they had consolidated some pieces of functionality in them and moved the things around, uh -uh. right? And so I could not compile, I couldn't just move the whole .c file around. What I ended up having to do was cut and paste bits of code from one of these .h files into another one and define a couple of functions that would have conflicted with other modules. But I actually defined them without exporting them and called them from, you know, so they were, basically I cut and paste the same function, MII tool function, into three different drivers so that it was local to those drivers. All right? Might Ugly? Yeah, but what I ended up with was a kernel module that could load in a completely unmodified dash 37 kernel. It looked like static linking only a <laughs> It was un ugly. I would never, I wouldn't, I, I'm glad no real kernel developers or, you know, none of the guys in the, in the credits Don't list worry. are here. Don't worry. Yeah, they're going to watch this video and go, man, that's it. Any submissions by this guy. <laughs> All right, you got it. So that is like the ugliest hacking I've had to do in Linux kernel. Right. Other things I've done that are, you know, like the simplest thing I ever did is the one thing that goes on my resume because it sounds great in an interview, even though it's pathetically simple. 
Uh, I was at that job where Tridge said, you know, what you need is Jim Dennis. Well, the first week that I was there, one of their firmware developers was trying to update a flash driver, all right, because they had a different model of the chip than what was in the kernel, all right? And so I helped him find the place in the kernel where the piece of code was, and he, on his own, discovered, oh, this piece of code for these flash memory devices, because he wanted to basically be able to write a, a driver that would reflash the motherboards that they were going to be shipping their embedded product on. It was a NAS device. Um, and so he needed to know how to do that. Well, he found the piece of code, and he said, actually, it was really simple, because one piece of code, and there's just a table that tells it what values to poke where at what I.O. ports, and what there were like some inter some timings for how fast it could do it, and all he had to do was add a new entry to the table, and add another thing which I helped him find in the make files, and boom, he was done. Right, and and he, so from the time that they put me on the job as a contractor till the time he had his first submission into their production code was two days. And later, towards the end of that project, now, of course, I'm not a kernel developer. And we told them up front, I'm not a kernel developer. So I most, spent most of my time helping their guys who were doing the, all the user space, the make files and stuff like that, you know, and little things where, you know, all kinds of silly things. Um, but near the end of this project, they needed a watchdog driver. Specifically, they were asking the question, this is an embedded NAS device. So it's supposed to be an appliance, like a disk appliance. All right. In fact, the company has since sold off that division. It was Quantum. Okay? And they were asking a question, what do we do to make sure this thing boots no matter what? And what I suggested is, well, okay, why don't you modify the kernel so that it starts with an initial watchdog entry. And if the watchdog reaches zero, then it cycles and tries to boot off of the next device. All right? And so they had control of the firmware, and so they modified the firmware so that it would cycle the boot devices. And actually, they, put it, they didn't put it in the kernel. That one they didn't make as a kernel hack. They actually made it as a BIOS hack, that if you didn't start petting the watchdog, it would reboot the machine off the next item on the boot list. But then what they needed is that motherboard, which was, it was Quantum Corporation, was buying those motherboards from a little company in Taiwan with a slightly confusing name, Quanta. <laughs> so they needed a watchdog driver for a Quanta Motherboard. And we got yeah. one Quanta. sheet of paper. By the way, those are the guys doing the OLPC. Quanta. I'm not yeah. saying anything it's bad about them. I'm right. just saying this is what. This, yeah, right. So I got one sheet of paper that had a bunch of gibberish on it and like two I.O. ports. Like one that you could write to to set the watchdog timeout number and the other one that you could do to like stop it from hitting zero to reset it or something. In other words, it was almost no information. And all I did was I dug through the kernel sources and found one of the watchdog dri drivers by Alan Cox, and I copied that to a new name, right? Quanta WT, you know, WDT.C. And I hunted through the make file, and I found the line that referred to that and copied that and gave it the new name. And then I went through, and I ripped out all the stuff that didn't look like I understood it and found the two things that looked like these I.O. ports, and I patched in this number, right? Rebuilt the kernel. It took me 10 minutes of editing. It compiled on the first try and worked and went into production. As far as I know, it was never modified. And years later, Quantum sold off that division, right? And I got a piece of email from some guy saying, your name is on this piece of source code that I got downloaded. And I'm wondering, I'm trying to port this watchdog driver to run under NetBSD because I want to run this old box on NetBSD. Can you give me any advice on this watchdog driver? I said, dude, if it ain't in the source code and in the comments, then no. <laughs> I can't help a bit. I didn't save the one sheet of paper that I had, but I did copy everything that seemed relevant into my comments. So, all right. So any other questions? Any ideas on where you would go from here? Everywhere. Oh. <laughs> go ahead. All right, schedule. Well, OK, so that's a natural one. And in fact, actually, what does the kernel really do? 
Okay, we already established there's a whole bunch of auto detection, and it obviously parses a command line. It sets up a bunch of memory stuff. It mounts a file system. In order to mount a file system, naturally, it has to have detected a bunch of block devices, at least one, and initialized it. All right. Um, and then it gets it starts off this init process, and init starts almost every other user space process. <laughs> now, remember, I, I actually used a almost. weasel word. Ah, I used a weasel word <laughs> earlier. I said traditional Unix kernels start exactly one and only one process. That's that's my years of teaching sysadmin courses that slips in that weasel word because the Linux kernel actually does a couple of things where it spawns off its own user space processes that are not related to init for a couple of different kinds of events. For instance, you say mount slash dev fd0 on slash mnt floppy. Most of your <coughs> vendor kernels don't have the floppy driver built into the kernel. So magically, the kernel is detecting that you have attempted to access a device that is not actually, the driver isn't present. There's a stub of code that says the name of this device is blah. And then what happens is the kernel spawns off a process which runs the mod probe command, which then tries to satisfy that. In user mode. In, it spawns okay. off a process in user mode okay. and runs it, and, that try, and it calls it with some arguments like floppy.o or something like that. And you can actually modify what the kernel calls as your mod probe command. There's a, a sysctl for doing that, or it's under proc, sys, kernel, something. Also, hot plug does the same thing. So there's actually two different sides of the way it's doing that. On the one side... I'm not sure everybody knows mod probe is dynamically... I'm getting there. Moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got stubs for these device drivers that all point at one piece of code called kmod, the kernel module loader. And whenever you trigger one of those, the process that was attempting to access that device or that network protocol or that executable format type, you try and load an a.out file that you managed to download from ancient history, the old word perfect for Linux from you know, a bazillion years ago. If you try and load something that needs one of those drivers, the original process is suspended. The Linux kernel follows that stub that says, call the mod probe command, so spawn off a user space process and call it with this argument. And then the mod probe command then attempts to load some kind of module to do that. And then when it's done, then the original process is scheduled for some time and either its process its attempted access to the device either succeeds because the device driver is now there and the device is actually there and functioning, or it fails, no such device. The, so that's something that started in user space, an action initiated in user space that triggered this event. But then there's the other side of it. These days there's all kinds of hot pluggable devices. So you slip in a card and what happens? Not mod probe. Oh, what, mod? It calls the hot plug demon. And on modern kernels, there is another thing that you can set, which is the hot plug utility that calls in and tries to automatically load and configure devices that you've hot plugged into it. So those might be a couple of really interesting things to go read. You could search on hot plug and kmod and see how they work. You could search on the string mod probe and find out where it's spawning off these processes. There might, I won't even promise that those are the only places where the kernel is spawning off user processes. In fact, if you search the kernel tree on kernel underscore exec VE, you might find some other examples because I'm pretty sure that that mod probe and that hot plug thing are being started by that internal version of the exec VE. And it might be interesting to even see um, what kind of preparation the kernel is doing to to make room for these things, like what kind of locking it's doing, for example, or who knows what. I don't know. I remember reading the KMOD one years ago, and so I don't even remember what it, I don't have any idea what it would look like today. Well, it's basically read and all that stuff comes in now. Uh, kind of, although hot plug interact, well, 
Yeah, you got Hal. It's actually kind of a mess because you got Hal D, Hot Plug, and UDev all with the subtly overlapping functionality. I don't remember when it disappeared. I just okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember, I'm always running with these RHEL3 kernels all day long, so I'm still Fair seeing enough. it. So the is there still a hot, du a hot plug dot D directory? There used to be, and it used, and they, they used to be backwards. And now it's Haldi. And, now, now it's no more. and in REL5, they renamed it to Haldi. Basically, UDEV has taken over that functionality, and HAL is just notified when new devices are connected by UDEV. Right, then, okay. And then if you're, if you're interested in when the new device is connected, then you'll get the message. That whole that whole series of things would be worth its own wild romp, and you could yeah. call it crossing the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> Perhaps. So his comments were about you, Dev. Ways to do it. Now, how many people are completely lost about what we're talking about with you, Dev, and DevFS and old devices? Okay. <laughs> I'll I'll give you just a couple of minutes of. I'll try and explain it as shortly as I can. The old-fashioned Unix kernels had these static nodes in the file system under a perfectly normal Unix directory named slash dev. And these little nodes basically take up an inode, and instead of a, like a file size, um, it had a major number and a minor number. Those are traditional device nodes. When you access one of those devices, those nodes, you can only do three things to a regular file under Unix, well, that actually care, that affect the file itself. Open, well, open, read, write, close, and ioctal, IO control. So I lied, there's like five things. He can also do seeks and some other stuff. Man. Now, stat actually doesn't do anything to the contents of the file. So your stats, chones, and chamads, they're only affecting some bits in the inode, some of the metadata. But the stuff that's actually in it, there's a limited number of things. And device nodes, in particular, you can open, read, write, close, and ioctal. Many devices are not seekable. You right. just seek your just uh, huh? I'm sorry? So seek, I don't think you're changing anything on the file. If you um, change the description, maybe. No, if you seek your changing, you have to call into the device driver's structure. Okay. And so a device driver has to know how to seek. Okay. You know, when you seek, there's, OK, so there are classically three types of devices in Unix. There are character devices, block devices, and network devices. And the odd thing about network devices is that there are normally, in most versions of Unix, there are no entries under slash dev for them. There is no ETH0, slash dev ETH0. They're funky. Some versions of Unix have them. If you want to learn more about how the user space actually gets a, a handle, and I mean that literally a file handle, on your network device to configure it, do an S trace of IF config ETH0 sometime. And you'll see what it actually does is it dives under older versions under slash proc. I think in the newer version, somewhere under slash sys, the sysfs, um, and grabs an entry there, opens that, and then does IO controls on that. So anyway, the concept I'm talking about here is that the old-fashioned model is device node, and the major and minor numbers are just these numbers that are basically pointers into the Linux kernel that tell it, oh, you're using you know, device driver number such and such, and the unit or the instance or on tapes, that minor number actually encodes an access method, whether you're using it in, re in rewinding mode, non-rewinding mode, what compression level, right? So that actually the minor number, while it was conceived initially as which one of these devices. The original model was very simple. I got n number of devices. I got a device driver for each one of them. And every instance of each driver gets its own minor number. But you can see where they kind of overloaded that to do things like, if you look at the uh, major and minor numbers of your floppy devices, I don't remember which the major number is, but there's one major number, and then you've got uh, FD1440, you know, high, high density, and the other densities. Those are all just different 
ways to minor to represent that. Minor numbers to represent the different modes of accessing it. Because it's really kind of passed to the kernel as an argument. So they've overloaded it in various different ways. So that's the old model, static device nodes. Then various different forces combined. I mean, if you take a traditional Linux box and you do an LS of your dev directory, it has every possible, you know, pseudo TTYs. So then, um, actually Solaris did this years ago, years before Linux did. They actually created a, a proc-like file system, which is the device file system. And Linux emulated that too. So you have a piece of kernel space that gives you something that looks kind of like a RAM disk or kind of like slash proc. Now, you can't just go under slash proc and just make a new directory. In most places, you can't chone or chamod the nodes under slash proc. You could try. You could try, and usually it won't do you any good. Okay? Under slash devfs, you could. You could make symlinks, and you could chone and chamod things. All right? This allowed you to control how certain devices were accessed. The problem with devfs is that, first of all, the guy who wrote it, I think, was Richard Gooch. And he tried to impose a sort of vaguely Solaris-like naming convention where you had slash dev, slash bus, zero, slash IDE, zero, slash CT, you know, control unit, this, that. In other words, the names were ugly. No, and the other thing is, was a cute compared to well, <laughs> the other thing is that it looked absolutely nothing like the normal old things that we were used to. If you want that to see every... how ugly they were, go fetch yourself a copy of the LNX My BBC. Old LNX BBC what they use. or <laughs> certain old versions of Mandrake were the only two things that ever used DevFS sort of in a distro that you end users would ever see. Right? So DevFS was a, more or less a complete flop. You know, it implemented it in kernel, but it also put the policies and the naming conventions embedded in the kernel too. That was the problem. And the kernel developers hated that because it made it a lot bigger. You got a whole lot of text strings. And because the mantra of kernel developers for 30 years has been kernels implement mechanism, not policy. And the names of devices institutes a policy about what you call them, as well as what their initial permissions are, <laughs> etc. So they didn't want that. So then somebody got the bright idea, OK, what we want is something that's kind of like DevFS, but that doesn't try to be all intelligent about what these things are going to be. So we'll just provide the mechanisms by which you can create new device nodes, and then will require anybody who wants to use that mechanism to go out and have a user space daemon to manage the process, to make the right system calls. So that's that. Um, those are the three of them. Um, other things we were talking about, what a kernel does. So we said scheduling. We said uh, file system access, which is one type of system call. Pretty much everything else, everything a kernel does on behalf of a user space program is a system call. Almost. I can give you one silly exception, huh? Signals. Signals are, well, you set your system calls via, um, excuse me, you set your signal handlers via system calls. Right. right. And then, right. then the kernel can call into you via the signal. Mm -hmm. So it dispatches signals to you. That's a good example. Another, um, Example of one way that the kernel can, you, that your program can interface with the kernel without going through a system call is fairly recent. It's called a VDSO, Virtual Dynamic Shared Object. And the reason this was done was because of threading performance. So threading under Linux was hampered by the fact that you had to go through a system call in order to do anything with a thread. And the setup and, and the, the transition from user space to kernel space to do these things was considered to be uh, unavoidable but um, expensive. So what they did was they came up with a way so that when you're using the newer threading model, your process actually has a small chunk of kernel code dynamically mapped into its address space. And libc, the glibc, knows when it gets one of these things, it checks to see if it's on a, um, a VDSO-enabled system. And if so, 
it basically punts right into a piece of kernel memory that is a user space chunk of code. It's almost like a, a kernel library that has been mapped into your address space. So that's one of the only non-system call ways to access Linux. And memory mapping is the other one. Uh, as a, I think as a point of order, what, you're, what you might want to say is that the traditional trapping mechanism uses the real traps which is a very expensive process in hardware, and that a VSL call is in fact a procedure call, which is much lighter weight <laughs> compared to a real kernel trap. Okay, so what John said, I'm going to be repeating this for the video, is what I might have wanted to said was talking about traps, right? Which is the traditional, okay, so what the x86 architecture calls an interrupt. Everybody else in the universe always called a trap. All right? This is not to be confused with the user space shell command named trap, which is actually just a thing that sets signal handlers for you. Um, and what he's saying is that when you make a system call, normally this invokes a trap or an interrupt. In Linux, the interrupt dispatch to the kernel is int 80. Zero. Uh, you know, 0x, 80x. Um, and there's actually, if we were to search for it, there's, um, if you look for entry.s is the name of it, it actually shows how the kernel calls its own system calls, right? Because entry is the entry point into the kernel from user space. Um, and as he said, in that model, the way that interrupts are processed on uh, x86 in particular is very slow. And it's inherent in the architecture that they can't speed it up. There's an alternative way to get into one of these system calls, which is called sysenter. That's the actual machine language instruction on x86, on newer x86s like since like Pentium 2s or Pentium 3s or something. The problem faced by the, the maintainers of libc is they didn't want to have to hand code or detect whether or not a particular kernel and processor combination could support this or not. In ways, it's a lot easier to say, do I have this library mapped into me? If so, I go through there. If you actually read the code for sysenter, basically, I mean, um, for the VDSO, it actually has some stuff where it makes it look just like it would have if you'd gone through the interrupt, and then it calls sysenter on it. Okay. So there's a little bit of fussing, sysenter, and then it returns. And it's just a way of basically faking out the system to pretend that you had gone through an interrupt, but you didn't actually have to go through the architecture's brain dead way of doing an interrupt. What about that Oh man, I don't know anything about FU Texas. If you want to talk about food Texas, you can come up here. I don't, <laughs> or we can save it for the next round. I know that they're user space only. That's all I'm going to know. Well, don't have to go to kernel space. No, actually, I do know one thing about them. I remember that in the case where there's no contention, they're handled entirely in user space. But if there's contention, then it actually, the kernel traps it, and then it has to resolve the contention. That's okay. the F part, fast part. Yeah, what makes fast user space mutexes, called few texes, what makes them fast is that in the most common cases for uncontested locks, it's handled entirely in user space, so it didn't involve any uh, transition from user space into kernel space. Uh, I have one good authority that does F U Texas. <laughs> F U Texas? <laughs> anybody, yeah, anybody who wants to tell me to S F yeah. S T F U, yeah, right. Anyway. So what else can I cover before we go? How much time have we got? What's in the corner? I'm sorry, Graham, what? What's coming next? Oh, where are we heading? Sorry, is Linux gate? Is, is that where you're OK, so if you're doing an LDD on a binary that has been, how the heck does this work? When you're looking at it, you'll see this reference to Linux gate. That's how it shows up. But you notice it's, it shows up in square brackets because there actually isn't a Linux gate.so. You can search your entire system for it, and it isn't there. 
but the symbol for a VDSO shows up as linuxgate.so. And inside there, you'll find your mouse of memory that, that, that links into it. OK. <laughs> I, I, it's been a while. I, so at work, um, by the way, I am primarily a sysadmin. Um, and actually, what I am is a level of escalation for a whole bunch of IT people to ask questions. And so at work, at some point, the question came up, what the heck is this Linux gate, and why can't I find it anywhere on my system? And so I wrote an internal paper and linked to something out on the, the web that described it a little bit, but then I described it in more detail, naturally. Uh, and that's where I, I learned all about VDSOs. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I wish I'd thought of that idea. Um, there's another one I'll tell you about. As far as I know, Linux still does not do this, but Trich told me about it one time. He had worked on some other architecture, some like Hitachi-based system. It had its own custom version of Unix. He said when they were trying to do some performance tuning on it, one of the things he discovered is that an inordinate amount of the time was spent handling get time of day. <laughs> right? And if you ever do an S trace of an old now, Mozilla got a lot better about this a few years ago. But on an old um, Mozilla, if you ever did an S-trace of it, and you move your mouse over, not clicking on anything, you're just moving it over, and all you saw was get time of day, get time of day, get time of day, get time of day. <laughs> what it's doing is it's asking, how long has the mouse been sitting there? Should, is it time for me to pop up one of those little help tool tip thingies? Right? And you would see just streams of them, a thousand per second or something. And what Trich told me is that a long time ago, on this old Hitachi system, what he thought of is, well, why don't we just have one page of memory that has stuff like the current time of day and like, um, like the copies of something like the, the U name? If you do an S trace, almost every binary starts out by asking, what kind of Unix am I on? Mm -hmm. Right? So he said, OK, we're going to map one page into every process of space, and we're going to modify the libc on that system. So that get time of day means fetch this uh, item from this page. So it's done entirely in user space. And as far as I know, Linux still doesn't do that, even though it would probably be really handy. Sounds like a project. Hey, sounds like you can write that one. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm a year and a half out of date. <laughs> Oh, and I wrote it! <laughs> but what that says is, I talked about they should do that. As far as I know, they still haven't. This is like an old comment log, that comment I posted to LWN. You and, oh, for those who don't know, the reason I'm signed on there as answer guy is because like 10 years ago, this guy named John Fisk was writing a little online magazine, webazine, called the Linux Gazette. And he was a student in medical school. When he went back to school at the end of the summer and got too busy to continue doing this, he made arrangements with the publishers of Linux Journal so that they took over handling the, the new releases. And the person who was their editor, one of their senior editors or something like that at the time, was owned by the name of Marjorie Richardson, who then set out a desperate plea for, can people help me with this, you know, maintaining this free project right, in my spare time? Because I guess the, the original assignment to her was given to her in her spare time. Mm -hmm. So I had written to her and said, well, here's some articles that I could write for Linux Gazette, and here's some articles that I sure love to read because I couldn't write them, mm -hmm. and they're things that I think would be interesting. And oh, by the way, I sort of do tech support for like a hobby, so I know that a bunch of people are going to send you tech support questions just because you're the editor. Why don't you just go ahead and forward them along to me, and I'll do what I can to make sure that they don't just go into the bit bucket. So she would forward these things along to me, and I would, because I used to hang out on mailing lists and net news, news groups, and answer technical questions how I learned everything I know about Linux at first. Um, so I would answer them, and I would copy her on the responses so that she know that it just didn't fall into space. A few months after that, I found out that she was taking all my answers, collecting them at the end of every month, and posting them in a column that she had named The Answer Guy. <laughs> so that's how I became the Linux Gazette Answer Guy. And so 
sort of in a sense of irony when I'm on Freenode and when you see me on um, sites like LWN, my login is usually answer guy. So it's not actually supposed to be conceited. It's supposed to be an inside joke. <laughs> so any other questions or homework? And what are we doing next week? Homework and what are we doing next week? Wow, I'm open to suggestions. Um, I really like the idea of looking a little bit more into the system call entry point. And um, one of the things that I would also suggest is have some fun with some of this stuff. Go into the kernel sources and add your own print case somewhere. And then build that, install it, and try and see your print K, maybe in main C here or something, see your print K pop up. You know, Kilroy was here or whatever. Um, and then try and, and see if you can figure out. Um, this has super cal powers. <laughs> You, yeah. But if they never heard of print K before, they, you should tell them the different levels so they're more likely to get it visible actually, versus not. Actually, you, if you do a Google search on print K, it'll tell you all about it. All right. And I actually, because it's your kernel, not mine, I don't care what level you call it with or anything. <laughs> so I would just take whatever example you find and put it in there. And if it doesn't work, then try and figure out what you did wrong, which might be that you set it at this really high, like, you know, uh, panic level and didn't. This is what's behind you. <laughs> Are we talking super then? <laughs> there are no so in an aptitude. So, anyway. Um. <laughs> oh, yes, the super cow. <laughs> I am definitely not in the mood for that. Oh. <laughs> We, we are cowed. So the other thing that I would look at is this whole how a, a system call goes from user space to what happens to it inside the kernel. And if you really wanted to be like super ambitious, create your own custom system call, which won't work for anybody else in the universe <laughs> that just does print K Kilroy was here, right? I mean, anybody who does that, I'll be very impressed. There's a print K in the kernel boot code on this thing that says hello world. And between hello comma and world in parentheses is children of the. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of cute. Yeah. So anyway, that would be my suggestion for homework is let's focus a little bit more on system calls unless somebody else has a better suggestion. You know, I mean, another possible place you could go is you could look up that mod probe and, and hot plug type stuff. Especially since, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Warren. 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 Warren tells us that the hot plug stuff is gone now. So what happened to it in the current sources? Maybe drill backwards, you know, through LXR, find out where it was and where it disappeared to, or something like that. That would be another possible uh, assignment. Just not, not done not the same like way in the whole user space. Yeah, exactly. So those are my suggestions. Um, in terms of uh, things like books yeah, that you could read, so one of, like, probably the gold standard for Linux kernel books um, is the O'Reilly Linux kernel and the device drivers book. And I would actually, I don't have it with me, uh, the O'Reilly Linux device drivers book is written by Alessandro Rubini. Um, I forget who the other author was in the original version. And then Jonathan Corbett, who's the guy who, you know, he's the main force behind LWN. Here you go. Here you go. Mm -hmm. Not that Right, Greg. Greg Kroll Hartman. Um, the three of them wrote the device driver's book. That's also very good. And it's going to talk a lot about what the device driver API is to the kernel. And it has to also cover a whole bunch of stuff about kernel internal functions, like print K and stuff like that, and um, some other odd things. All right. I mean, one of the things I'll mention about, you know, we talk about block devices and character devices. Under traditional systems like Solaris, you've got a raw disk and a disk. And raw disk is a character mode device driver used for two things. 
to make FS and to, um, to do FISC, file system check. So it opens it up, as in how you'd open up a text file, and it just streams through and seeks back and forth all over the thing in raw mode. A block device, normally the only things you can do with it are basically like mount and unmount it. You can't not, under a traditional form of Unix, you cannot open such a device with reads, writes, and seeks. Linux said, wait a second, I'll get to you in a moment, John. But Linux said, hey, wait a second, we don't actually need two different nodes out in the user space file system to do that. We can tell the difference between an open and a seek and a read and a write and a mount. So Linux is very unusual in that you can actually use the same device node. You can open block devices with character mode operations. And if you read the device drivers book or you read one of the online tutorials about device drivers, which maybe should be about two classes from now, but the, con the concept of a device driver in the kernel is you register the device with a bunch of pointers to, these are my B underscore ops, my block operations, and these are my F underscore ops, my file operations. And so to write a device driver, you create a structure that has pointers to your functions that says, when you call me with the seek operation, here's what I do to maintain my state on your file descriptor and my underlying device. This is what it does to me. And when you ask for a read, then here's how I do reads. And ioctal, which of course is kind of the tar pit of everything else, or the, the um, what's the, the phrase I'm looking for? Not tar pit. Tar baby? No. The, yeah, kind of the everything that's left over, the catch-all. If you can't figure out how to do it as a read, write, you know, seek, etc., then you toss it in as an ioctal, and the kernel developers hate you. <laughs> All right. So, any other things? Oh, and John, I know you've been waiting. What did you want to say? So the second thing is that a lot of databases open up uh, this drive wrong, and that's because they do their own uh, file system caching. So they're smarter. They think they're smarter about it than the file system. Oh, what a can of worms. Okay, so what John pointed out is that um, some database systems have in the past opened up certain types of devices in raw mode. Now, the fact is that, as far as I know, none of them ever did this with your normal de um, disk devices, your HDA or SDA. What they actually used was a special set of raw device drivers in the Linux kernel. Raw zero, raw, you know, slash dev, R-A-W, zero through whatever. And there was some really weird stuff that I do not remember about mapping those to actual blocks or block devices. John remembers them, I bet. And then there's another thing I point out, and that is um, the I.O. controls are often the access to the error logging and um, status indicators on the disk. So when you want to know, for example, if your disk drive overheating or if you've had excessive error rates, you have to use the I.O. control mechanism to find that stuff out. Right. So he, what he was pointing out is I.O. control, or I.O.C.T.O.L., um, was the traditional way of accessing things that are not that basically metadata about the device. So for instance, um, to do a rewind on a tape. Right? Because of the way a tape works, you can seek forward, you can seek backwards, but, but tell the device to rewind was an ioctal. To, uh, to tell it file seek forward. So if you know anything about tapes under Unix, the traditional model is a tape is a character device, and it's a container for multiple anonymous files. Right? So they didn't have names, they don't have ownership and permissions. There's just a stream of bytes and an end of file. And then there's another stream of bytes after that, and another end of file. End of record. They could be records or files, because you could do both. So there are these ioctals that say, seek record forward, seek end number of records forward, seek file forward, seek to end of data, seek to end of tape. Right? And these were all different concepts that were done because they couldn't fit into the normal file operations. And it wasn't a block device. So that's ioctal. Now the last thing I'm going to say about raw devices is Oracle, as far as I know, considers raw devices under Linux to be a deprecated model. They do not recommend that you use that. And the Linux kernel developers have said for years, if you use raw devices, you're an idiot. <laughs>
<laughs> right? They may put it sometimes a little bit more tactfully than that. On the other hand, this is the kernel developers we're talking about. They might use even stronger language, right? But you know, raw devices is like a huge can of worms, and you know, I don't know if you want to see a, a place in the kernel that is probably very, very neglected and where there's likely to be lots of bugs. I'll, I'll, okay, one time I'm sitting at a party. And somebody tells me, you know, man, I'm having the most trouble with our Linux machines at work, and blah, 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 blah. And described all these hangs and, and kernel crashes and all this stuff. And I said, I looked at her and I said, you guys are using raw devices, aren't you? <laughs> and she just, her face did something bizarre because she's like, that was spooky. How did you know that? I said, because... What you describe is nothing like I've seen anywhere in the rest of the world, and the only place in the kernel I can think of that is going to be that badly neglected and that likely to have weird bugs is the raw device support. And that was like eight years ago that that conversation took place. So, anyway, I think we're probably over time now. So any last words? Do we want to follow any book or anything like that? I'm sorry? Follow any material, any book. Uh, uh, what, what I recommend for everybody here is that Wicca, can you bring up that Wikiversity page again? So create yourself an account on Wikiversity and go in. You know, it might be faster to find that thing. Oh, you found it. No? There. And also, can you hit the history page, the button? Okay, so I'm the only guy who's ever edited this page so far. But anyway, what I'd like to see is everybody here, I'd love to see them edit something either on the page or the discussion page. So if you want to say something that everybody will see and consider part of this page, put it on this page, and if you want to say something about what you think we should do on the real page, then put it on the discussion. So. Awesome. Um, OK, so you want to show up next week? I, I will show up next week. I cannot, I cannot promise that I will be here I'll, the next two weeks at least. So next week, we'll talk about system calls, how to add your own system call, and what machinations the kernel goes through in its transition from user space to um, to kernel space and back again, how it does a system call. Uh, and then the, after that, we'll give just the barest overview of what a device driver is like. We might like do something silly like look at the watchdog driver, <laughs> like the one I wrote or the old Alan Cox one. Because mine, I don't think, was ever actually submitted to the kernel mainstream. It's such a niche device. Um, but yeah, that would be good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.